Some 239 years into the existence of the United States of America, is there a disconnect between the founding principles of the U.S. Constitution and our current political landscape? My first guest says yes, and he explores this growing gap, as he calls it, and the big money corruption that he warns is fueling it in his latest book, The Republic of Conscience. So what would America's founding fathers might say about the current situation in Washington? Let's find out with the best-selling author, two-time presidential candidate for the Democratic nomination and former United States Senator Gary Hart. He joins me from Centennial, Colorado. Thanks so much. Great seeing you again, Gary. Great pleasure to you. I'm very happy to be back in touch. Thanks for this book, too. How would you describe right now the current American political scene. It is a great distance from what the founders intended. They warned us that we could not keep the republic that they were creating 200, more than 230 years ago if we let corruption seep in. Today we would call corruption bribery or criminal activity. They defined it as putting special or narrow interests ahead of the common good or what we would call the national interest. If you apply their standard to today's Washington, we are massively corrupt. And also, uh, under the concept of a republic, you're supposed to come together, right? You're supposed to you, discuss things and iron them out and mediate. Exactly, and this traces back to ancient Greece and Rome, and that's what our founders wanted, what they called popular sovereignty, power to the people, but also a sense of the common good and a sense of citizen participation. We are falling short on all those counts, and they warned us against the fourth principle, and that was the encroachment of corruption. I want to move to the book in a couple of minutes, but first some current things. What effect do you think uh, Donald Trump will have on the whole Republican primary? In the long run, not very much at all. He's getting disproportionate media attention. I think if um, the media quit responding to his inflammatory rhetoric, he would disappear very quickly. But are you a little discouraged with the, by the fact that it seems a lot of people support him and like his ideas on Mexicans and immigration? Well, presidents uh, manage this country on more than one issue. We have no idea what his economics are. We have no idea what his foreign policy would be. We have no idea how he would behave as commander in chief. These are areas he has no expertise in, and we haven't heard a word from him about them. That's what being president is all about. So we've had one note candidates throughout our history. They emerge, they excite people, particularly in the age of, of instant media, but then they flame out. He, he is not going to be a finalist for the presidency. Colorado, has, your state, has its uh, fair share of immigration problems. Is that still an important topic there? I wouldn't think so. If you, if you were to run a poll of uh, everyday Coloradans on a scale of 1 to 20, uh, I think immigration would probably be about 18. You're no stranger to media scrutiny during a political campaign. You've had your share, good yes. and bad. What, how do you compare your era to the media treatment of candidates now? Well, in some respects, it's returned to, I suppose, what you would call normal or traditional coverage. There is less intrusive, uh, in effect, spying on candidates, peeking in windows and the rest of it. But I think there is also this kind of um, reality show aspect to it which is, in the Trump case, the more outrageous you are, the more coverage you get. Uh, is Hillary Clinton the obvious nominee of, the, of your party? No. No? But, <laughs> well, obvious. Um, I have to go back to 1984 when I was at about 2% in the polls, and when the first primary came around, I won it pretty handily and then continued throughout the 50 state contests, ending up at our convention in San Francisco with over 1,200 delegates. So it's much too early to begin giving out the coronation. I think uh, all candidates will have to earn 
the nomination along the way. What do you make of Bernie Sanders? Well, again, I think he, uh, as you would well know from your experience, he uh, is in the mold of, um, uh, uh, I think, Howard Dean, for example, Governor Dean back in 04, and other candidates who early on captured public imagination, excited people. Whether that will last, we'll have to wait and see. He certainly touched the nerve with a lot of people, especially young people. Well, he has indeed. And, and I think, frankly, if I may say so, it's partly because of the theme that I pursue in this book, and that is disenchantment with the close political system and the power structure in Washington. And I share that myself. So um, young people, middle-aged people, old people, there's, there is a growing sense that everyday Americans are shut out of participation in government. And that leads to disenchantment, and that leads to lack of confidence and faith in our government, and that's, that is a very dangerous situation. You have decried political dynasties. You've charged the United States as developing a political oligarchy. Do you think a Clinton-Bush race would be a symptomatic of that? Yes. Simply but, yes, but that looks... If, that's... They, if, each, <laughs> if each of them wins the respective nomination by participation in caucuses and primaries, and the majority of voters in their respective parties select them, then so be it. But leaving aside the names or the families, there has been, on the Democratic side, four, there have been four, Cl four Clinton presidential campaigns. I think on the Bush side, something like seven or eight Bush, Bush involvement in a national, on a national ticket or in a campaign. Yeah. Uh, I think back to the book, what this means is to be a serious candidate, you have to have the network and the Rolodex to raise the money necessary to run for president. That shuts out an, a, an enormous number of people. Are there days you regret not having become president? Well, of course, I would. Uh, I still believe I would have been a very good president, but that's so long ago, Larry, that it's not even worth pursuing. Before we're going to get right to the book, but what's your reaction to the ending of the Confederate flag on the state capitol in South Carolina? Long overdue. I think um, people can have their own museums, their own history. They don't need to make a an ancient history that was very divisive into official history, which is what displaying that flag in, on state capitals does. I've been active recently in, in Northern Ireland on behalf of our government, and one of the issues there are flags and parades. And if you say that to Americans, they, they roll their eyes. Why are they so concerned about flags and parades? Well, look at South Carolina. Yeah. And by the way, are you surprised at how quick the public has shifted on same-sex marriage? I think we all are. It, um, for those of us who have, are happy and honored to have gay children or gay relatives in our families, who finally, after years of being in the closet, felt free to come out, I think that had more to do with changing public opinion than anything else. All right, now let's get to the title of your book. What do you mean by Republic of Conscience? It's a quote from a Nobel Prize winning Irish poet, Seamus Heaney, who wrote a poem called The Republic of Conscience. And I use that in the epigram to the book. But it really is about what the founders intended. And that was that we have a conscience about this country and what it stands for, and not let it be corrupted by money and influence and power. When I go back to the Senate in which I served, which you're very familiar with in the 70s and 80s, fewer than 3% of the members of Congress became lobbyists. Now there are over 400 former members of Congress who are paid lobbyists, and that, that amounts to about 50% about of members of Congress of both houses leaving those offices, walking across the street, and making millions of dollars lobbying. That's a huge change. 
You're right about the founding fathers and the current situation, but they had a lot of hypocrisy too. Uh, they said uh, all men are created equal. They weren't talking about black Americans, were they? No, and I cite that in the book, the shortcomings that we have had throughout our history. What I comment on, on in the book mostly is the last 25 or 30 years, but women didn't get the vote until 1917. We didn't get begin to get civil rights in this country till the 1960s. So uh, it's been a long, hard struggle to live up to, to our founding principles. But the one that is now most perplexing us is this principle of violation of our commitment against corruption of our government. When did this change? Well, I'll give you two examples. In late 1979, I was beginning a race for re-election to the Senate, and a group of Coloradans came in. We had a light, nice discussion. Whatever group they were, they had their Washington representative, and then they left, and my administrative assistant came in, gave me a plain white envelope, and I opened it, and it was a check for $2,000 for my re-election campaign. I gave it back to him. I had him run down the hall and give it back to the Coloradans. Somebody had told them that they had to pay to see their United States senator. So for me, that was the beginning of this era of corruption. And then when the campaign costs began to, to escalate astronomically and... We didn't have members of the Senate like Stuart Symington and Gaylord Nelson and Philip Hart and those great senators who would never have thought of becoming lobbyists. And this exodus began. That's when sometime, no date certain, I would say in the late 70s, early 80s, this uh, cascade began. And that Supreme Court ruling which said that corporations are people was that one of the worst decisions, in your opinion, in the court's history? Larry, I can't imagine a C student in any law school in America thinking that a legal fiction called a corporation has the same First Amendment rights of free speech as individual Americans do. You can't find a support for that theory anywhere in the constitutional debate. So it's got to be reversed. The problem is it will take t a new court and 10 or 20 years to reverse it. But you and I are going to be around to watch it reversed. Despite all this and the changes in corruption, we elected a black president. How, do, how, does, how does that come up in your st st the way you look at the structure of things? Historic. And one of the ways that Barack Obama was able to prevail in 08 was the bright light on the horizon of campaign finance. And that was the emergence of the internet as a means of raising funds. And as you know, in, the, in that first year particularly, that first campaign, he raised uh, tens of millions of dollars from small contributions. So I think despite all of the big money in Washington, if candidates can find a way, if they voluntarily reject political action committee special interest money, and use the internet to raise $10, $15, $25, and I think Senator Sanders, among others, is doing that, that will be healthy and therapeutic for our system. Hillary Clinton wants to appoint judges who undo the Citizens United decision, but she's raising more funds than anyone, apparently. Is that hypocritical? Or is that just well, the nature well, of the beast? <laughs> when I served, uh, there were many occasions where individuals would say, this system is, is rotten, but I have to partic participate <laughs> in it so that I can change it. Um, I also quote that old saying from an anonymous se Southern senator, if I can't eat their food and drink their whiskey and vote against them, I shouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> I think each individual candidate will have to make their own presentation and make, and and select their own values, but uh, I think it would be very helpful if she did not accept political action committee money. In October of last year, you were named the U.S. Special Envoy for Northern Ireland. What does that involve? Well, it started with George Mitchell, as you'll recall, yeah. in the mid-1990s. I, among others, urged 
President Clinton to send uh, a special envoy to Northern Ireland to help resolve the troubles and end, end those troubles, end the killing in Northern Ireland. And George Mitchell was enormously successful in 1998 and deserves great credit. credit. Since that time, depending on the circumstance there and the intense interest on the part of Irish Americans, we have had one or another individual uh, represent our government in those discussions between the British government, the Irish government, and the five parties in Northern Ireland. I must say, during the promotion of this book and possibly thereafter, I've suspended, suspended my involvement on behalf of the State Department because I didn't want this book to interfere with uh, the effort that John Kerry is making and our government is making in a variety of venues. And uh, we'll see what happens after the book promotion. Is Northern Ireland a settled situation? In terms of, uh, of the kind of violence that prevailed in the 60s and 70s, yes. But it is, uh, just for perspective, it's an area the size of Connecticut with about a million and a quarter people, 45 to 55 percent Catholic and Protestant. And there are still divisions between those communities, still two separate sets of schools, still protests, flags, and parades, and some serious economic problems. And we came very close on Christmas Eve last year to negotiating a successful comprehensive agreement to deal with all these, and then it, it came unglued over welfare reform. So we'll continue to try uh, and keep our fingers crossed. Uh, the book can be looked as a distressed, depressing state of the state, if we can put it that way. Do you see any cause? Do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? I do. Where? I do, Larry. I'm, I, I say at the end that you... The way you know you're an American is to be an optimist, and that's, that's me, and an idealist. I, I've read a lot of the history of this country, and we've been through, as you pointed out, some very bad periods. But in the end, the right prevails, the right thing prevails, and we have an era's, era of reforms, and we get back on the track. I think it's only a question of time before the American people rise up and demand a more open government in Washington, one that is more honest and more transparent, and in which the big money does not control things. We're a government that was still people. And I remember the Senate of your days. I could name every senator when you were in the Senate in the 70s. I could name all of them, all 100 of the Senate. I couldn't do that today, I dare say. I bet the president couldn't do that today. What caused this division where Senators don't have lunch together anymore. You mean uh, Humphrey and Goldwater were friends? What happened? Well, and, and Barry, <laughs> Barry Goldwater helped get me reelected in Colorado in 1980. It's a very interesting story, but we don't have time for it. That's exactly right, and you will remember those big figure, figures, and they were big figures. And quite simply, they put the interest of the United States ahead of their party and ahead of their own in most cases, their own careers. And many of them were not career politicians. They served two or three terms, maybe four, and then they went, on, went back home. They didn't stay in Washington, and they didn't become lobbyists. I think it was the rise of factions, um, if I may say so, particularly on the right, that have begun to dominate the control of the party in that respect. I don't, frankly, find the same kind of pressure from liberal groups that I think may have happened in the past, unfortunately, but um, there it is. And there is much more orthodoxy, much more insistence on candidates meeting a certain uh, very conservative agenda that even Barry Goldwater wouldn't have agreed with in his day, and I doubt even Ronald Reagan. Said. Gary, always great seeing you. Thanks. Stay, stay loose pleasure. and stay around. Best wishes to you. <laughs> you too. The book is The Republic of Conscience, and it's out now everywhere. Gary Hart, our special guest.